Chris, but <laughs> I don't have a, a Bible like he does where I can uh, not have to use notes, but anyway, praise the Lord. Get a few things out of the way here. But this morning, if you'd like to turn to Psalms 34, Psalm 34, we're going to look at a Psalm of David. David was a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> That's what we want to be, people that follow God with their whole heart. Did David make some mistakes along the way? He did, didn't he? Some pretty bad ones. Anybody else have any uh, things that they have done in, in their Christian walk that weren't quite what was supposed to happen? Well, I can say the same is true for me, too. But, Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that you would bless it. Lord, just as we pray when we partake, Lord, of physical food, we pray that you would Bless the bread of life in Jesus' name. Amen. So David, he was called. He was anointed by Samuel the prophet. He was appointed. He was a man of God. He was a man of faith, hope, and love. And that's the kind of people we want to be, isn't it? People that are full of faith, people that are full of hope, and people that are full of love. Well, Psalm 34, verse 1, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Is that an easy thing to do? <laughs> Anybody that's lived for the Lord for a few weeks or months knows that it's not always easy to do that. The longer we go, we make a little bit of progress in our lives, but anybody have a hard time in 2022 doing this every single minute of the day <laughs> I have to raise my hand too but he's a man of God and he encourages us and he says that this is a psalm of David when he was pretended like he was kind of insane when he pretended madness before Abimelech who was a Philistine leader who drove him away and he departed so here he no, he's, uh, if you've read 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, in the beginning of 1 Kings, you've read the life of David, and you've seen many things that he went through. This was kind of early. This is way before he became a king. This is when Saul was first starting to chase him all over the place, which took a while. And anyway, here he writes this during this time. It's like, mm, that's, you're going to have some uh, trials and tribulations, David. But, you know, it's not over yet. <laughs> But we don't always know what's around the corner, do we? Do we know what's around the corner in the United States this coming year of 2023 or in the world? We don't, do we? But God wants us to be like David. He wants us to have faith anyway. David was anointed by Samuel the prophet, the last of the brothers that were brought in before Samuel. And so he had a word from the Lord that he was supposed to be a king, but did it look like he was going to be a king? For quite a while, it didn't look too good, did it? In fact, he was being hunted, just like Pastor Chris and some of his relatives are out hunting in eastern Oregon in the John Day area this week. David was out being hunted. He was being hunted by his father-in-law, King Saul. And David, you know, he didn't have a whole lot with him. It tells us when he went, he went to the priests, and he got the priests in trouble. In fact, it was a kind of a disaster. But he uh, didn't have any food. He was running away because Saul was after him, and he had a bad intent. Was, was King Saul full of faith, hope, and love towards David? <laughs> no, he wasn't, was he? He was full of the opposite. What's the opposite of faith, hope, and love? Doubt, fear, and anger. And that's exactly what was churning in King Saul's heart towards David. He was jealous of David, wasn't he? He didn't like David. David was getting a lot of glory for doing wonderful things for the Lord and for the country. Anyway, going on from here in verse 2, it says, My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. David knew that he wasn't all that great by himself. He needed help. We all need the Lord's help, don't we? 
the humble shall hear of it and be glad. And the people that really serve God and are walking with God in the steps of faith, hope, and love are people that are humble people. Pride isn't going to get us anywhere, is it? What does pride go before? A fall. Do we want to fall flat on our faces? We don't, do we? We want to walk in faith, hope, and love. And humble people walk with us when we do that. Verse 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. David was a psalmist, you know, and he went against Goliath. You now he had a shepherd's bag, and he had a sling. I believe he had a sling in there. He always carried it all the time, probably. He, had, uh, he probably had his lunch in there, maybe his breakfast. <laughs> Who's going to go out without food, right? He probably had, like, I think he might have had his a little harp, maybe like a small harp. I don't know that much about Hebrew harps, but I've, I've seen pictures of various types. They have bigger ones and smaller ones. I believe he always carried one in his, he might have had a pretty good sized little bag and he carried his harp. Because what are you going to do out there? There's no radio, right? There's no uh, cell phone coverage out where he was. So what did he do? He just took the harp out and he just made up his own songs to the Lord, right? And he just kept track of those. And I believe that uh, later on when different people started joining him, the people that became part of his mighty men, I believe that sometimes he would be singing some of these psalms. And some of them probably got to, just like we learn psalms, you know, songs in church. You hear them on the radio. You, you know, you hear them in church. You might have copies of different things that you like on your playlists or whatever. And what happens? You just get to know them. And like we say, this is my story. This is my song. Why? Why do we not need the words? Because we've sang it so many times, right? It's kind of a traditional uh, great song of the church. And the same thing as became true with David's psalms. He started singing. And that's a person after God's heart is a person that's a worshiper. And so if you want to be a person of faith, hope, and love in the rest of 2022 and into 2023, what do you have to do? You have to take your eyes off of all the problems of the world, and you have to put your eyes on Jesus, don't you? David had to take his eyes off of King Saul. He had to take his eyes off of the Philistines. He had to put his eyes on God. Here he was by himself. Now he's, he did probably, after this, people started coming to him, but this was just all brand new. He's just running away from his father-in-law. And he says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. The word magnify, I looked it up, says to enlarge, in fact, or appearance, just like a magnifying glass. You've seen magnifying glass. No, you can put them there if, if you have bad eyesight. What do you do? You just kind of make it so you can see, right? And that's what we do when we magnify the Lord. We're bringing him into focus so we can see what's really real in the spiritual realm of our lives. That's what God wants us to do, to be spiritual people that make a difference in the world and extol and enlarge him to others. In uh, it says in verse 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me. When you really seek God, he listens, doesn't he? Sometimes we think he's not listening, but sometimes we're not really where we need to be when we're asking him things. But I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Whose fears were they? They were my fears, David said. And a lot of times we have our own personal fears. Now, everybody has, you know, fear is kind of a part of life in this world, isn't it? It's kind of wise to have some kind of fear. You know, if a little child puts their hand on a hot stove, they learn to fear, you know, the stove, but it is wise to have some kind of fear, but there's good fear and there's bad fear, and God wants us to have the good kind. A lot of people are fearful in our world right now, aren't they? But what did David say after this? I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. Who is they? We don't really totally know, but you can kind of make up your own theory on that. 
Maybe it's talking about people in the past times, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. They had fears at different times too, didn't they? Everybody does. But what did they do? They looked to God. And that's what we have to continue to do. And they looked to God, and what happens? Their faces became radiant. You can tell when uh, you're not looking in the right direction many times, what happens? You start getting frown lines, right? Have you ever looked in the mirror? And sometimes I look in the mirror, and I think, oh. I have kind of light-sensitive eyes when I'm driving. I look in the rearview mirror sometimes, and I, oh, I got frown lines. <laughs> and sometimes Penny says, quit frowning. It's like, I'm not frowning. But you can't always tell, but what's ever on your face just comes out, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, when we look to him, what happens? Our, our whole countenance changes. And even though we're living in a time of uh, doubt and fear and anger in our society, and it's not just in America, it's in all kinds of places in the world, isn't it? It's in Europe, it's in Africa, it's in South America, it's in Asia. And you no, know, we know that Jesus is coming soon and we can kind of see glimpses of different things that are mentioned in scripture, but people are afraid, aren't they? But does God want us to be bound up in fear as believers? People are afraid of nuclear weapons. You know, there are people keep rattling sabers. You know, you hear about that. And then people say, well, there's too many people in the world. You no, know, we have to slow down the world population thing. You no, know, we're running out of all kinds of things. We have too many people and not, a, not enough uh, supplies. We have crime. We have recession because of all this. Inflation. Global warming. Penny was talking with her uncle anyway a few weeks ago, and he was talking kind of about these things, and she said, well, you know that the Earth's, he was talking about global warming, and she said, you know that the Earth is going to last for over a thousand years more, don't you? And he goes, what? He says, it's in the Bible, Revelation chapter 20. There's called a millennium. It's not going to end, you know, in the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. <laughs> Jesus says he's going to take care of us. He's the one that made this planet. If he can heal our bodies, can he heal the planet? He can, can't he? So he doesn't want us to be all anxious for all these things. He wants us to realize that we're valuable. In fact, he told you know, his followers that you're more valuable than many sparrows. That's really encouraging Jesus. <laughs> that we are, aren't we? We are more in, important to him than we th sometimes know. And so... What is value anyway? It's worth that we put on people or things, isn't it? The world puts value on things too, doesn't it? No, a basketball in my hands isn't worth a whole lot of money. But a basketball in LeBron Jordan's hands is totally different, isn't it? Because he's way more valuable to the NBA team. They all want him. Why? Because he's one of the greatest players that ever lived. But... God doesn't want us you know, to put our value on those kind of things. He wants us to put our value on who he is. He's the most important. You know, I, some, I heard a preacher say, talking about value, that he says, just think about what would happen if you went into Walmart, say, and you uh, took a price tag off of uh, a box of toothpaste or something. You put the price tag off the box of toothpaste on a large screen TV. And you went up to the checkout stand. How would that go? They would know it's not true, wouldn't they? <laughs> because they know it's way more valuable. And how much more valuable is God to us than anything we can learn or do or see? or you know that There's nothing in this world that compares to who he is. And people are important to God. In the last month or so, Different times, God is reminding me of John 3, 16. It's like, well, I've been a Christian a long time, and that's one of the very first Bible verses I memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But he was kind of widening the, uh, the look of that. It's, he was like, for God so loved the various kinds of sinners of the world because how many kinds of sinners are there? There's all kinds of sinners.
There's sinners that go to church, right? There's sinners that don't go to church. We all have things that we have to have help with from the Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter if it's a great big sin that winds somebody up in prison or that causes all kinds of problems, God still loves that person, doesn't he? Some of the people in the Bible did some terrible things, and God forgave them, didn't he? God doesn't hide these kind of things in the Bible. Look at Moses. Moses killed an Egyptian, didn't he? There's all kinds of other things. we could. David had uh, somebody killed, Uriah the Hittite. And then he, uh, no, even before that, he had a bad relationship with Bathsheba. And all different kinds of things came out of that. But God so loved even King David and all the things that he went through that what did he do? He gave him mercy, didn't he? He gave him mercy. For God so loved all the various types, even the really, really nice people. Do you know that there's really nice sinners, isn't there? Do you know any really nice sinners? They're still sinners, though, aren't they? Somewhere, somehow, some way, because you can sin by not even doing something. It's called the sin of omission. When you, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, what does the Bible say? To him it is sin. So you can sin by not even doing anything. What? That's not fair. <laughs> but that's how it is. Now we know we're supposed to do some things, and sometimes we let fear stand in the way, don't we? Verse 17 in John 3 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the various types of sinners of the world. Aren't you glad? But that the various types of sinners through him might be saved. So no matter what kind of a person you know, might bother you and you might pray about, you might have a problem praying for that brand of sinner. God still wants us to pray for people and to work in their lives and help them. The, the, not the apostle Stephen, but the first martyr that we, is mentioned in the book of Acts, Stephen. He put value on people, didn't he? He put value on the words of Jesus, and he put value in the Jewish people. He was trying to help them see that Jesus is the way. The Sadducees and the Pharisees came against Jesus. The Sadducees and the Pharisees came against Stephen too, didn't they? The Sadducees, you've probably heard it said that they're sad, you see, because they don't believe in life after death. This is it. Live for it right now. This is all you get. Once you go six feet under, it's over. But that's not true, is it? There is a resurrection. The Pharisees, they were partly right. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in angels and spirits. They believed in a lot know that we believe in they just didn't believe in Jesus but God's not looking for Sadducees and he's not looking for Pharisees that have it partly right there's a lot of people even in our own country that have it partly right but God wants everything to be brought into alignment in our lives with him God's not looking for Sadducees and Pharisees it kind of came to me when I was looking at this it says God is looking for Christ you see I've never heard of it before, but it works for me. <laughs> He's looking for a Christ, you see. In order to be a Christ, you see, you have to see Christ for who he really is, don't you? And all of his truth and all of his wisdom and all of his love and all of his glory and holiness. You have to see him as he really is. <clears throat> and then as we look into who he is and we have him change us as we go by, you know, our walk in life as he changes us you know, slowly from glory to glory by the Holy Spirit as we get into you know, all the things that help us. What happens? People start seeing Christ in us. In fact, the Bible talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not only hope for us, but it helps other people have hope when they see how changed our lives are. Maybe people look at you and they say, wow, I remember what you used to be like. 
you're not that same person anymore. Aren't you glad? Maybe they are too. <laughs> but Jesus wants us to be like Stephen. What happened? He looked unto the Lord and his face became radiant, didn't it? He said that his face shone because he, like David, was looking to Jesus. They looked to him and were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. Stephen was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, was he? And then it says, this poor man cried out. This is David writing again. This is kind of a long song. If you actually sang this song, I don't know how long it would take to sing it, but it's shorter than the 119th Psalm, I guess. Anyway, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Now, does it say that he saved him from all of his troubles? Or does it say he saved him out of all of his troubles? Does God promise to save us from all troubles? No. If you've been a Christian for a while, you know that that's not true. <laughs> We're still going to have troubles, aren't we? Stephen had troubles. Paul had troubles. Peter had troubles. Mary, the mother of Christ, had troubles. But God still hears our cries, and he saves us out of all these troubles. Sometimes that might mean you're a martyr. That happens, doesn't it? People die for the cause of Christ. But God delivers them. And then in verse 7 it says, The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. So God wants us to realize that he's always working behind the scenes doing things for us. And he delivers those who fear him. And I mentioned that we were going to talk about good fear and bad fear. Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a trap or a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Well, how did that work for Stephen? <laughs> He's safe with Jesus for many, many years now, isn't he? <laughs> He's safe with Jesus. And David, he still had more troubles to come in his life, many kind of serious ones. But the thing about David, the man after God's own heart, was he was always humble, wasn't he? He, he would humble himself. He might have a problem with pride at first, but then he would see he was wrong, and he would do what? He would humble himself. He would seek God. In fact, he had a priest that stayed with him, and he would get out the Urim and the Thummim, and he would seek God for answers. What should I do? Should I do this, yes or no? And he would seek God. He wouldn't just go out on his own. He would repent if he needed to. And that's what we have to continue to do, is repent when we need to. Obey God's directions and live in faith, hope, and love or else we'll end up like Saul, won't we? Saul was full of doubt. What does doubt lead to? Unbelief. If it's, not, if it's not checked, fear. What does fear lead to? Hopelessness, anger, frustration, bitterness, finally to hatred. It kind of looks like social media sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> But that's what happens because people are looking at the wrong things. They're fearful because they think the world's going to end if we don't do something. And they're not really trusting God that it's going to be okay. We should still do what's right. We should take care of the planet. We should do what's right. But God is going to be with us. He will help us if we will work together and do what's right. And Mark chapter 8, if you want to turn there. Mark chapter 8, Peter is following Jesus. Verse 27, Mark 8, 27. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah and others one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. 
That seems kind of odd in these days, doesn't it? Don't tell anybody about me. <laughs> now we're all supposed to tell them about people about Jesus, aren't we? Verse 31, and he began to teach them. All right, Jesus is going to teach us some more. He's taught us the Sermon on the Mount. He's taught us all these parables and stuff. Now what's he going to teach us? He's going to teach us that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. I don't like this teaching, Jesus. That's not what we want. He spoke this word openly, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, adver adversary. That's what Satan means. You're being an adversary to me, Satan. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, I know Peter wasn't really born again yet. He believed in Jesus as the Messiah, but he didn't really know what was going to fully happen. The Holy Spirit had not totally come into his life yet. But what was Peter's problem? He had the right confession, but he had the wrong mindset, didn't he? He had the wrong mindset. And sometimes we as believers can have the right confession. We can say the right words, but we can have the wrong mindset because God knows what's in our minds. He knows what's in our hearts. Sometimes we don't even fully know what's going on God has to show us ourselves sometimes. It says, you are not mindful of the things of God. What is my mind full of? Is my mind full of the things of God? It should be, shouldn't it? Bless you. <laughs> I was looking in uh, the men's ministry app from the Assemblies of God, and it has some things for uh, discipling men. And anyway, it says that there's different groups of people. There's unbelievers. Then there's believers, people who have received Christ as Lord, kind of like Peter right there. They kind of have a belief system. They know the Bible stories. I used to be like that, right? I accepted Jesus for the first time when I was seven in church. Then... I accepted him for the second time when I was 12 at a youth camp. Then I uh, rededicated my life when I was 15 <laughs> and uh, was baptized in the Holy Spirit at a different youth camp. But I'm sure my parents and different people that knew me were thinking, come on, Rick. Get with." There's more to it than just saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So believers are people who have received Christ as Lord. They have a belief system, but haven't yet become learners who really obey God's word. They don't have the right behavior or actions to go with it. And that's why sometimes Christianity gets a bad reputation, isn't it? I know I didn't help it when I was younger. Then... People go from there. The next step is to become a disciple. So people who adhere to the teachings and practices of growing in Christ and demonstrate a lifestyle corresponding to God's word. These are the true disciples. That's what happened when I was 24. I gave my life back to God, and I started totally devouring God's word, and I just couldn't get enough of it, and I started going to church every time the doors were open. I started doing everything I knew to do to grow in the Lord. That's what God's looking for, is not just believing, but he wants us to grow. The next thing is to become a servant leader. Servant leaders are people who have grown in the direction, ways, and timing of the Lord. And the direction, the ways, and the timing Peter hadn't done that yet in, act, in uh, Mark chapter 8. He was kind of thinking mainly of himself, wasn't he? Jesus paid my taxes in the fish's mouth. Jesus healed my mother-in-law when she was sick. Jesus is feeding me, and I get to help hand out the food to the 5,000, and that's all great. But there's more to it, isn't there? 
people that are servant leaders start to understand God and his ways and he doesn't always do things in the same timing that we think he's going to do things. They too, so they, they start learning these things and they start sharing their knowledge of Christ with others. So they start talking about how to live for God with other people. His direction, his timing, they're involved in different aspects of church life. Even at work, they talk about God. Even different places, they're living the Christian life just as if they were in church they're wherever they're at, right? That's how you live for God wherever you're at. Because he's with us wherever we go. Then we become reproducers, people who mentor others. That's a good stage to be in when you are helping another person learn about Jesus. That's another step further in your maturity in Christ, helping other people through relationship to the point where they become not just believers, but they become disciples and then servant leaders themselves. Then they start mentoring other people. That's how we all got here. This started 2,000 years ago almost, and what happened? Somebody had to keep it going, right? Somebody had to teach somebody else. Somebody taught you. Somebody taught the person who taught you. Mark 8, 34, Jesus calls his disciples and says, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So I have to ask myself, have I denied myself anything to follow Christ? Mark 8, 35, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? That's what I had to come to the conclusion of when I was 24 years old. Am I just going to live for myself or am I actually going to surrender? It doesn't matter that I'm a preacher's son. It doesn't matter that I know Bible stories. I'm not living for God. I've got to repent. I have to obey God. There's no other way. I have to make a new highway in my mind. I heard a preacher talk about this one that I thought was really good. You know that uh, in our minds they keep, have you ever woken up and you got something running over and over in your mind? And as soon as you wake up in the morning, it's still there running around. Because our minds have like highways in them that we go through the same thinking things. You know, the brain can kind of run by itself. You know, it's, it's, causing all the heartbeat and everything, all the things that work in your body, but it also your own soul connected to it thinks about things. And so to make a new highway in your mind, if you've been living for yourself and the devil, what happened? What do you have to do? You have to make a new highway. God can't, the Holy Spirit's not going to obey for you. You have to obey God, don't you? And so this preacher was saying that in order to make a new highway through your mind, do you have to like go out into the forest with a machete? And you have to clear a path. You have, that's what getting into God's word for yourself is all about. Clearing a path, listening to teaching, getting in worship and stuff, listening to you know, good things that will edify you in the scripture and thinking on the things of God. Get your mind full of Jesus. You're making a pathway through the forest of your mind. And you're breaking old patterns. That's how you break old patterns. You have to get in God's word. And I'm not a preacher. It doesn't matter. You got to get in God's word for yourself. <laughs> There's no shortcuts. That's what we want. We want to get back on the old highway and just do the same things that we always did. But God says his ways are higher, so you've got to get down out of the low land thinking up into where the high places of God are. You've got to make a trail, and then the trail has to be paved as you go over and over it again. It turns into a highway because his ways are higher than our ways, and so we have to change to be like his ways, don't we? Back to Psalm 34. 
Oh, forgot something. Verse 38, Jesus says in closing, this is a verse that stuck out to me at one time, and I've always remembered it. I always know it's the last verse in Mark chapter 8. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, that's what the devil's trying to do. He's trying to make people all over the world be ashamed of Jesus' words. Who, what are Jesus' words? They're not just the red letter words. They're every single word in this book, aren't they? They're all his words. <laughs> They're all his words. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I don't want Jesus ashamed of me, so I can't be ashamed of his words. No matter what, I don't care what my cousin thinks about Jesus' words. I don't care what my boss thinks about Jesus' words. I don't care what this person or that person or this group or that group thinks about Jesus' words. I believe Jesus' words. His words are true. His words will stand forever. His words are the words of eternal life, aren't they? Wow. I'm getting blessed up here. <laughs> anyway, back to that. Now we can go back to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And David learned to bless the Lord at all times, no matter who did or didn't like. Remember his uh, wife, Michael, when he came back in with the Ark of the Covenant? Covenant what did I say? <laughs> Anyway, forgive that blunder. <laughs> I have uh, lots of blunders. <laughs> but what happened when he came in with the Ark of the Covenant? He was celebrating and dancing before the Lord. and He was so happy to have the presence of God coming into Jerusalem. He was just so joyful. And what did, I know Michael's kind of a weird name for a girl. But anyway, what did Michael, his wife, do? She looked out the window and she goes, Ah, can't believe you. You're making a fool of me. Why? Because she cared more about what people thought about how she looked, right? <laughs> what did David say? I will be more undignified than this because he, didn't, he wasn't trying to be dignified. What was he trying to do? He was trying to bring the presence of God into the nation in a big way, to be at close. It, they'd been satisfied. They'd been sitting out in a, no, Outside of the city of Jerusalem, no one was paying that much attention to it. Just the priests and stuff, and then they bring it in, and you should be happy. We want the presence of God in our lives, in our homes, don't we? Anyway, verse 17, Psalm 34. Better close it down here. Let's go to 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. God hears, doesn't he? What's he hearing? I wrote down here, murmur, 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 complain, complain, complain. Anybody ever been there before? Sorry to say, I've been there more than once. Even though I've been living for God for over 40 years, I still have had times where I've battled a complaining, murmuring spirit. But what do I do? What did David do? He humbled himself. He repented, and he started obeying, right? Started blessing God. What if Jesus had murmured and complained when he went to the cross? Father, I've helped all these people. Look at all these people I've helped. Look at all the people I healed. I showed them your ways. I taught them your words. I took the disciples you gave me. They all left me. What am I going to get out of this? What if he said, sorry, I can't do it? Where would we be? But he didn't, did he? 
What he wants to hear is, what do you want me to do, God? Do you want me to bring the Ark of the Covenant back in? <laughs> bring it back. <laughs> bring the presence of God back. Wouldn't it be great if another mighty revival comes in America and all around the world and people are like totally shocked that God is still alive and really real, that this Christian thing isn't some fake thing. That's what I want. I know that's what you want too, isn't it? What do you want me to do, God? Help me show others your ways. Teach me of your word more, more and more, Lord. Open up the eyes of my understanding. That's what Paul prayed over and over again, didn't he? Help me teach others who you are. God, you are worthy. You're worthy, Lord. That's why I bless you at all times, no matter what's going on. In fact, Larry read this earlier when he was up here for his prayer time. says, you are worthy, O Lord, Revelations 4.11, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And here's a good prayer. Help me live a life of faith hope and love God when other people are angry when other people are bitter when other people are doubtful and they're fearful help me to be full of faith help me to be full of hope help me to be full of love so that it comes out in my actions comes out in my words so that they know Instead of seeing frown lines on my face, <laughs> they'll see my face shine because of Jesus. Because as 1 John 4.18 says, last verse, in the middle of the verse it says, perfect love does what? Casts out fear. So, if I'm fearful, that means my love isn't quite there yet. What do I need to do? Press towards the mark, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's stand together in closing. All right. I even got 10 minutes to 12, so just in time. <laughs> I won't get in trouble with Pastor Chris when he comes back. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for this time together this morning. We do want you, Lord, to bring, we want to help bring the presence of God back into our country, God. We pray that you would help us, that you would help our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, to be full of faith, hope, and love. Help us to overcome evil with good, Lord. Help us to believe, to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven to see goodness, Lord. We can see and do good things now. Because when we do good things, our light shines, Lord. And people see our good works. And then it causes them to ponder. And then they start understanding that it's because of you that we're glorifying you. And that you are real. That you are living and you're alive and well. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And Jesus, when he went to the cross, what did he do? He sang a hymn, and then they went out. So we're not going to sing a whole hymn, but let's sing. Uh, here's another old song of the church. To God be the glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God bless you all. Now the ministry just...
begins as you go out the door, right? When you're on your job, when you're at your training center thing, just love people and love Jesus, right? When you're at school or whether you're at the campground or wherever you're at, bless the Lord. God bless you today in Jesus' name.